Good morning to all. Today is Tuesday, January 31st, 2023. The House Full Insurance Committee is now in session. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Representatives Capley, Sapicki, Davis, Freeman, Helton Haynes, Hemmer, Hicks, Johnson of Montgomery, Johnson of Knox, Lafferty, Mitchell, Ritchie, Rudd, Rudder, Sparks, Terry, Thompson, Vice Chairman Martin, Chairman Kumar. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Members, welcome. Uh, do we have any personal orders? Seeing none, uh, this is our opening meeting and we have new members, but also this is the new General Assembly, the 113th. Uh, let us introduce ourselves. Tell us about uh, of course, the area that you represent, as well as what professional talents you bring to uh, the committee and to the legislature. Uh, I'm Sabi Kumar. This is my fifth term, uh, and uh, I represent Robertson County, which is immediately north of here, uh, north of Davidson County. So our slogan in Robertson County is that minutes from Nashville, miles from ordinary. Um, to my right, Chairman Terry, kindly go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Brian Terry, represent District 48, which is the eastern half of Rutherford County and includes the monument for the exact middle of uh, Tennessee. It, I have uh, part of Murfreesboro and I have MTSU, Las Casas. I got a uh, Milton. I've got a lot of uh, eclectic district. This will be my, this is my fifth term and I appreciate serving. Thank you. Mike Sparks, uh, Smyrna, Laverne, Murfreesboro, um, District 49. Uh, have two sons, Preston and Peyton, been married 34 years now. And um, as I said in the earlier committee, just picked up a grandbaby. The little baby's name is Grace. And if y'all remember, we passed the bill, Make an Amazing Grace. It was my bill, the first, uh, the official hymn of Tennessee. I called a girl the day and she was like, that's so amazing, that's so amazing about the grandbaby. And I said, yeah, her name's Grace. So really excited for this new grandbaby. And I love serving on this committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Hi, my name is Esther Haynes, and I'm starting my third term. I live in Eastridge, Tennessee, which is part of Hamilton County, and um, I am a semi-retired nurse. Good morning. I'm Iris Rudder. I'm starting my third term. I serve the 39th District, which is Franklin County. That's my home county, and Marion County. Um, I was previously a small business owner, and I'm glad to be back. Thank you. Uh, Representative Scott Sapicki from District 64, which is the eastern half of Murray County. Um, there are some constituents of mine here that I'll be mindful of, uh, but uh, also I'm a mortgage banker and a cattleman by trade. I have a wife of 25 years and two uh, high school boys, so looking forward to uh, some football coming up this fall. Thank you. I'm Tim Rudd. Um, I represent downtown Murfreesboro and South Central Rutherford County. I'm part of West Rutherford County, 34th District. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad to be here. Wonderful. <clears throat> My name is Elaine Davis. I am representing South Knoxville, um, District 18. I have been married over, I guess, 26 years. I lost count. Doesn't matter anymore, right? And I have three children, and my oldest just made me a grandmother. So congratulations on grand new grandbaby. Those are awesome, wonderful things to experience and enjoy. And I'm retired and absolutely excited to be here and serve. Thank you. Uh, Brian Ritchie, District 20, which is Maryville, Lewisville, Greenback on the Blunt side, and Friendsville. Uh, almost married 19 years. We've got a 17-year-old senior this year and a 10-year-old that's in fifth grade, uh, entrance background um, with MetLife, traveling around the country as a uh, sales director with them. So looking forward to serving on this here with you, Chairman. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Dwayne Thompson. I represent District 96, which is in Shelby County. I'm one of the 13 reps from Shelby, but unfortunately, only the only one on this committee. Uh, I am uh, serving, starting my fourth term. I have a district that runs from the suburbs to the inner city and very, very diverse. Uh, I am a retired human resources professional and uh, dealt a lot with uh, group insurance programs, which gives me a little bit of insight into um, into the insurance part of this uh, of um, policy in the state. Uh, married for almost 44 years, uh, two adult children. Uh, my other job uh, besides this is trying to work with grandma to, to, to spoil my five grandchildren. And, uh, I am just delighted to be here again. Yeah, I'm Bo Mitchell. I represent the Western part of Davidson County, Bellevue, Joelton, uh, Goodlettsville and part of West Nashville. Uh, that's house district 50. I guess I'm in my sixth term, and yeah, I've got an insurance background. Thanks. I am Gary Hicks. I represent the Ninth District, which encompasses part of Hawkins County, also Claiborne part of Claiborne County, as well as all of Hancock County. I'm married to my wife Laura for be 20 years this uh, next month. So uh, bless her heart. And then I've got two daughters, Caroline and Madeline, and this is my fourth term. Yep. <laughs> Justin Lafferty, I uh, represent the uh, 89th district there in Knox County, uh, largely comprised of the Northwest section, uh, as you look at it on the map there. I've uh, been married a little over 20 years now, got a 17-year-old daughter, and not enjoying dating time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> glad to be here, looking forward to serving another, uh, another session here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Curtis Johnson. I represent the 68th district, which is the eastern part of Montgomery County. I'm starting my 10th session. Uh, and uh, well, I've been here 19 years. That gives you an idea, Chairman Hicks. Uh, I'm a retired small business owner and uh, just glad to be here, Mr. Chairman. I may be out of order, but I just noticed that we have a couple of former colleagues uh, in the audience. Uh, former Senator Bill Ketron and former Senator Jim Tracy. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Caleb Hemmer. Uh, in my first term, I uh, represent the 59th district, which encompasses all the uh, southern border of Davidson County. Uh, married, I uh, got two small, uh, slightly wild, feral children, um, and uh, work in the healthcare and uh, health insurance industry. I'm Brock Martin. I represent rural West Tennessee, District 79, which is portions of Gibson, Carroll, and Henderson County. I'm a chiropractor by trade. My wife and I both are for the last 12 years, and we have a six-year-old son who's in kindergarten. I am humbled to be on this board and this committee and look forward to serving. Well, thank you. I represent Johnson. We didn't mean to bypass you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No problem. I'm staying true to my name from Rep. Right, Front Row Glow. So, um, House District 90 in Knoxville. Didn't used to be in Knoxville, so it takes some getting used to. Um, and it is old North Knoxville. Actually, the district looks, make of it what you will, it looks like a monkey wrench. But um, <laughs> uh, House District 90, happy to be here on this committee. And up in Capley, you. Thank you. My name's Kip Capley. I represent Murray Lawrence, Wayne Harden in the house, and uh, honored to be on this committee. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you. To complete the introductions, we do have our research analyst, um, Ryan Vallone, okay. as well as our LA and the coordinator for this committee, um, Colleen Johnson. And we have clerks, uh, Jackson Stubblefield and Alora Stewart. 
and we have Mr. Sergeant of Arms with us. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we do not have any uh, bills at this time yet. In, uh, they are all in the pipeline. So uh, we are using this time in a constructive way and to get education from our Department of Commerce and Insurance, uh, our uh, commissioner and assistant or deputy commissioner are here. Kindly step forward. We look forward to your presentation. I need to go out of session. The committee will go out of session. And gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, kindly, for the record, introduce yourself and tell us what insurance is all about. <laughs> Very good. Well, good morning. My name is Carter Lawrence, and I serve as the commissioner at the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. I really appreciated the opportunity to get here uh, from all of you, uh, who you are, what you do, um, and where you're from. Uh, Representative Hammer, I believe I live in your district. Uh, in fact, I think I saw that you had your election night party at Sal's Pizza, uh, which is our favorite local pizza joint, uh, where my feral children, uh, ages eight, four, and two, like to eat. Um, but it is a uh, privilege to be up here with y'all today to have an opportunity to give you know, a brief overview about what insurance is. Uh, and before I let uh, Assistant Commissioner Bill Huddleston go into uh, into the specifics of what insurance is broadly, I did want to take a mention, a little bit of uh, opportunity to talk about the department broadly, because while insurance is one of the things that's in our name, it's certainly not all that we do. Uh, so we actually have seven divisions at Commerce and Insurance, of which insurance is one of those. Uh, but it's as wide ranging as the regulatory boards, which is a lot of the commerce side of that, which are the occupational licensure, uh, where we have about 300,000 licensees across 22 boards um, and uh, commissions. And we oversee 10 care oversight, uh, security is the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy, Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, uh, Emergency Communications Board. Um, and I hope I didn't miss, miss anything. Uh, but my point is uh, that we are privileged to be able to serve really all Tennesseans in different ways, but all Tennesseans on a daily basis. Uh, and we have about 850 positions, about 750 employees who work with us across the state to be able to serve uh, all of those Tennesseans who I mentioned. Uh, so we have a phenomenal team. I'm biased, but I truly do think that we've got the best in state government. Uh, it's been my privilege to work uh, with them, leading them. In fact, uh, I started out as an assistant commissioner at Commerce and Insurance uh, back five years ago where I oversaw the regulatory boards and have been privileged to be uh, promoted up now to the commissioner. So uh, the colleagues who I have an opportunity to lead now, many of them I worked with earlier. Um, and I hope that it gives some uh, unique perspective and oversight into um, overseeing the department and hopefully supporting all of our phenomenal employees. So uh, that's kind of the, the broad overview. Um, as we move into it, I'll just highlight our mission statement of uh, our vision of protecting Tennesseans through balanced oversight of insurance and regulated professions while enhancing consumer advocacy, education, and public safety. As you can imagine, with seven different divisions, it's hard to come up with mission and vision statements that encompass all. Hopefully, we did a good enough job of talking about protecting uh, serving and trying to understand the proper role for us in regulation of the regulated industries. Uh, speaking of the regulated industries, insurance is incredibly important in Tennessee. We'll have a slide at the very end uh, where we talk about some of the economic impact uh, of insurance in Tennessee. Um, and so I, I don't want to steal the thunder from that later on, but we understand how important insurance is to consumers' everyday lives. Uh, business would not happen without proper risk mitigation. And we understand that it's important for us to properly regulate that important marketplace. Uh, so to do that, we have a staff that uh, you see some of them here, including uh, Senator Tracy, uh, who you noted uh, earlier is in attendance, and we're pleased to have him on the team. But we've got a lot of great professionals uh, who serve in the nitty gritty of insurance regulation. Uh, we also uh, are engaged with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Uh, because insurance is regulated at the state level, and we think that's the best place for it to be regulated, it's really important for us to stay engaged and involved with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Uh, so we were pleased uh, to receive reaccreditation from NAIC uh, two years ago for a five-year term, and we got kind of a rare, uh, totally clean bill of health from the NAIC in that review. 
uh, we have uh, we're engaged in NAIC in a lot of different ways at the staff level. Uh, and then I've taken on a couple of leadership positions within NAIC also in order to be able to uh, best represent and, and protect Tennessee consumers and advance the interests of those consumers. Uh, so again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Bill at this time to walk through the slide deck. And uh, please, if you've got questions anywhere along the way uh, for myself, for Bill, for anyone interrupt, we'd be happy to answer those. And if you think of any after the fact, uh, we will be coming by your office at some point or asking to come by your office. Um, so uh, ask us uh, whenever, when we stop by, when you see us in the hall or uh, call us up for a meeting. We'd love to continue the dialogue. So thank you so much, Bill. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, and thank you, Chairman and committee members for uh, giving us some time this morning to have a conversation about insurance. Uh, I, I kind of started thinking about uh, insurance regulation and the industry and uh, goodness, where to start? There's just so much, and it's so such a broad subject um, that this is kind of a, a very general presentation, and I will be painting in very broad strokes. Uh, but uh, as Commissioner said, glad to fill in any details here or later uh, if if you guys need to meet up. Um, I think Ryan's actually are going to be at our office tomorrow for a meeting to. Uh, uh, to kind of go over some of this too. So uh, my door is always open. But um, I guess um, since it is such a broad subject, um, you know, I thought I would just start off with basically what is insurance? Even though a lot of people in, in this room probably know that already, um, uh, I thought that would be a good place to just kick off the conversation. On this slide, there's some different ideas about what um, insurance may be. Uh, or the way people think about it. Uh, transfer of risk is certainly one of it. The safety net is, is something, but, uh, or, or a way to think about it. But um, I think generally all of these ideas are made up of a couple of uh, different aspects. There's an economic aspect that is, you know, where there's a financial intermediary that is, um, made up of a pool of payments by insureds so that they have a claim on that that pool if certain contingent events happen later. Uh, and then the other aspect of it is more of a legal aspect where uh, which is basically the contract. The contract that is between the insured and the uh, insurance company that lays out all the specifics of how much is the payment what are those contingencies in the timeline? So as we're thinking about that, um, that that's kind of the general definition of insurance. But I guess to move from there, I kind of want to talk about the whys and hows. So um, given that that's, that's what the, the insurance product is, um, why regulate it? And so uh, that's an important question. And before I even really get into that, I'd like to talk about just the word regulate. Um, something that's important <clears throat> is that that's not always, although it sounds punitive, uh, it's not always a punitive uh, uh, relationship or scenario. It's what's even more important uh, it, as we regulate to be smart regulators is to clearly communicate and to be transparent with what we do and to set clear uh, expectations for the regulated industry. Um, um, you know, I, I think that's that's really important to do that so that to, to protect the marketplace and uh, to have a healthy environment for marketplace. Um, generally speaking, at the department, all of our activities, all our aims, actions fall under it's two pretty big ideas of financial solvency monitoring and uh, market conduct. So we're essentially making sure that the company has money to pay claims or promises that they've made. And, and that's really the biggest part of what we do, just um, because really what good is a, is a insurance company with no money. But uh, market conduct is the other piece, and that is to make sure that companies live up to the promises that they've laid out in those contracts. Um, I think um, uh, Commissioner mentioned NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and that, to sum up the idea I just talked about, I think their mission says it best. And here I quote, um, the NAIC mission statement is, 
to protect the interests of the policyholder and those who rely on the insurance coverage provided to the policyholder first and foremost, while also facilitating an effective and efficient marketplace for insurance products. And I think that word marketplace is important uh, because there's a lot of things that we do every day that I think sometimes are taken for granted would not happen were it not for an insurance product. Many doctor's office visits happen every day that could not happen. Uh, many people buy homes that uh, have to have insurance in place for them to get a loan to buy the home. Um, it, it, it's, you know, the iPhone. I, I like to use this one too. This would not be in my hand were it not for a truck that delivered it to the store where I got it. And that truck wouldn't move without insurance. So it's a very important fundamental piece of business. And so that marketplace is important to protect. Um, so to get to um, how we do things, I think it's also important. Uh, there are, you know, certain uh, widely accepted economic ideas about um, about about the market and that um, an unregulated, perfectly competitive marketplace uh, would, um, you, you know, I guess it, it moves resources most efficiently to social welfare, to maximize social welfare. Um, and and I, I think there's a strong case for that to be made. And that if, if that's the case, then we, we decide where to intervene or regulate based on where we see inefficiencies uh, in, in that competition. Um, summed up, I would say that, you know, we would intervene or see fit to intervene where there is an inefficiency that is material and impacting uh, in, in an important way and that our intervention would help assuage that, um, those inefficiencies to move towards uh, having those resources um, uh, used in the most efficient way. Um, I guess how, who and how is the next thing. State uh, authority is very important, as Commissioner said, in, in regulating the industry. Um, there are important roles for the federal government and the state governments in regulating the insurance industry. The framework uh, is such that the federal government, as we all know, oversees interstate commerce, but a lot of insurance is primarily left to the state um, uh, to regulate. And that's affirmed by McCarran-Ferguson passed in 1945. It, it, it establishes the state's role as primary regulators. Uh, and so um, based on, 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 on that and some other case law, uh, the states, you, you know, we, we are the primary regulator. Um, so if you think about having 50 states and then the five other um, territories that are also part of uh, the United States. You've got 55 different entities there with 55 different uh, regulatory frameworks, right? So how do you efficiently get the these all 55 ter states and territories together in a way to make it an efficient market? Um, Commissioner mentioned NAIC, and um, it is just a, um, I guess, a voluntary association of uh, all the states and territories where we get together, work with other states. And the most important thing that we do is, is we develop model laws and regulations to try and create an efficient marketplace. The whole point of it is supervision of multi-state insurance companies. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, the multi-state uh, insurance company. But um, Commissioner mentioned the accreditation program that we went through. We get examined every five years as a state to make sure that other states can trust our work that we do on our regulation of our domestic insurance companies. That accreditation program, um, it includes um, 
a review of our solvency laws that are in place, um, that we have effective financial analysis and examinations in place, uh, that we cooperate and communicate with other states, um, that we effectively respond to troubled insurers, and that we have appropriate organizational and personnel practices in place. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of since we've since I've been working with the department is that we did pass that accreditation a couple of years ago with no findings, a couple of positive attributes, which is not usually the way it goes with state accreditation. A lot of times they find uh, issues with other states and address those. But we, uh, we passed with uh, in a really strong uh, way with just flying colors. So um, the, um, I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead here on uh, the slide deck. And uh, here are a couple of uh, just slide decks that have insurance products, different types of lines of business that we uh, cover. Uh, but I really want to get to what we do, our regulatory scope at the department, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, and the first thing um, that we do is related to our financial analysis and our examinations teams. Um, uh, part of that is licensing of insurers. Um, you, you have uh, different types of insurance companies that want to do business in Tennessee. If they're headquartered in Tennessee, they are called a domestic insurance company. Anything, any company outside of Tennessee is uh, what we would refer to as a foreign insurance company. Uh, just that just means they're from a, another domicile, and uh, and so all of those companies have to have certificates of authority to operate here. Uh, and we have an admissions committee made up of all our directors. They all look at those applications and require pretty uniform, standardized compliance with with our laws. Also. They look at minimum capital requirements and uh, surplus. Uh, but we look at, has this company had complaints in other states? Um, how have their examinations been in other states? And um, so we, we, we have a pretty stringent admissions process. Um, but the other, um, I guess, thing that the, on the financial side that we do, like I said, is the solvency monitoring. It's very important. We do it on site. Uh, we have an analyst on staff that review quarterly financial statements uh, that are submitted on a routine basis. They're filed with us. And uh, so, so that's very frequent. Our statutory examinations have to occur every five years for uh, our companies. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a situation where we send examiners to the company and look at everything from operations to claims handling. Uh, we we look at um, and it's and it's a risk based it's a risk based uh, examination. Meaning we look at risk that are currently uh, you, you know currently present, but also try to do a prospective risk analysis too to look forward at what what could potentially happen uh, in the future. But we, we, we uh, in addition to looking at reserves and capital adequacy, we, uh, we also look at the department. Uh, we have regulatory control over transactions that could, um, you know, I guess, uh, impact solvency. So that would mean change in ownership. It could mean dividends. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different things we have control over as far as transactions and have to approve those transactions for the company. Um, we, um, uh, I guess, um, the next, so where it says policy analysis, um, actually, I think, there we go. Um, this is another important piece on the front end before, uh, after a company gets a certificate of authority, before they can go to market with any product, we, we approve the forms uh, and rates for that company. So, Different states do this in different ways, but in Tennessee, 
we're a prior authorization state, which means nothing can go to market with that company that we don't approve prior to them going to market. Some states have a file and use uh, system where it can go to market and then has it can just be approved retroactively. Uh, but we uh, we are a prior authorization state. Um, and when I say forms, by the way, I should clarify by forms. I mean, policy contracts, it, it could be communications, uh, any kind of disclosure to the uh, to the insured. Uh, we we look at all that, review all of that. So um, we also produ um, uh, license producers. So the agents, not just the companies, but we license agents and brokers. And Tennessee right now, you have to have a certain amount of uh, uh, education to set for the exam, licensing exam. Uh, you also have to have continuing education every two years. And um, at this point, we have about 313,000 uh, licensees uh, in insurance, about, thanks, uh, about 68,000 of those uh, are resident uh, residents, um, the balance being non-residents, agents from other states that just sell policies here. Um, and then I guess the next thing is consumer protections. Uh, that's when I think about that, um, it's consumer protections really across all of these uh, um, across all of these sections or functions that we have. Uh, but our consumer insurance services is very important in complaint handling. Uh, last year, uh, they handled 33,500 formal complaints, fielded thousands and thousands of phone calls for educational purposes. And um, they have mediation authority. So on a complaint, uh, you know, complainant calls in and this is what my problem is. We go talk to the insurance company and uh, we have in that mediation authority can recover funds. Last year, our consumer insurance services recovered $11 million in restitution for complainants um, in that in that mediation process. Um, so again, this is a very broad brush I used to paint over all of our regulatory functions, um, but I, I would like to talk a little bit about um, some of the e some of the economic development or market, uh, just the numbers in the marketplace. Um, we have um, doing business in Tennessee, almost two thousand insurance companies. Uh, uh, it's actually 1,994, but uh, so we're close. Uh, we also have non-insurance companies, TPAs, third, you know, third-party administrators, or um, other types of uh, uh, PEOs. Um, uh, there's 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 a number of those, but uh, out of um, the non-insurance companies that we have registered in Tennessee, it's 1,462. Um, so there's a lot of companies that, um, that are make up this industry that, um, I guess I'm bringing those up to say there are some, some companies that aren't insurers. Uh, but, um, last year, the premium, uh, the premium amount up here, uh, is on the slide that, uh, last year premium written in Tennessee was $45 billion. Um, that's across all lines. That's, that's life, health that's property casualty. Um, I would uh, also point out and uh, that, you know, of that premium that was written, uh, one and a quarter billion dollars of premium tax was raised for the state. It's a, it's a pretty large revenue line. Um, and I believe it's maybe the third largest uh, on the, uh, um, uh, on the budget for revenue, but um, something that's important to know about, the premium taxes, I think it may be the only uh, type of tax that is assessed on gross revenue. It's 
It's not something that's written on a after tax profit. It it's written on the front end when the policy's written, that premium that's paid, it's based on that. So I think that's that's kind of important for, for the context of, of where that comes from. Um, but I, I think that's on economic development. That's that, that's all I really uh, you know have. Uh, I don't know if um, if commissioner has anything else or if we just want to open it up for questions at this point. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. So um, I will maybe just highlight one of the things that Bill said before uh, wrapping up, seeing if you have any questions, uh, because I understand um, that maybe one person or multiple people from industry are going to speak after us. I think uh, that what I've learned at National Association of Insurance Commissioners is that Tennessee is somewhat unique in the relationship that we have with industry, with our regulated uh, companies in Tennessee. You know, we do not always agree with them, uh, but we promise them that we will always give an explanation for the decisions that we've made and that we're not going to surprise them. Uh, they, in turn, are very communicative with us, and we have a really healthy relationship, which is one of the reasons why we have an incredibly healthy marketplace in Tennessee, uh, which is to the great benefit of our consumers. And that's something that we definitely are focused on protecting along with uh, our regulated companies. So, um, Mr. Chairman, hopefully that was what you had in mind when you invited us up here to give that little uh, overview of insurance. Uh, if not, we apologize. We'll do better next year. Uh, but at this point, we will conclude there and see if you have any questions. Thank you. No, thank you for taking the time and thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, the most common question we get from our constituents is, why is insurance so expensive and why are my rates going up? and also understand that all rate increases are approved by the department. Mm -hmm. Kindly tell us the process and how you justify that. And what do I tell the person who's actually just, mm -hmm. who's just plain mad that their insurance rates have gone up? Absolutely. Uh, so first, we are also all consumers as well. So it's something that we feel um, uh, as we are paying uh, our premiums too. So I totally understand and get it. Uh, that said, there are a lot of factors that are going into that. So I think something that we are hearing a lot right now is related to automotive. And uh, anyone who has followed the you, the car market realizes that used car prices, new car prices, uh, labor, repair, everything has increased drastically over the last few years. And in order for the companies to maintain the solvency that Bill talked about earlier as one of the two main focuses that, that they have to have statutorily means that they have to be able to pay their claims ultimately. So they have to charge more, uh, collect more in their premiums. Uh, so those are submitted to us and kind of oh, may, maybe somewhat oversimplifying. Uh, according to state law, if they are actuarially justified rate increases, then we are to approve those. And of course, actuaries can and do disagree. And we are always questioning the actuarial assumptions uh, but broadly, that is our authority and the limit of our authority uh, on rate increases. Um, so, Bill, anything to add uh, to the chairman's question? Um, yeah. Yes, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Good question. Um, and, and Commissioner, that's yeah, very good answer. I, I would add. Um, I, I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things we hear about right now too, is just inflation across the board, right? And that the cost of everything's going up, um, and it's important to remember that um, those solvency requirements plus the insurance is essentially a pass through. I mean, um, to put it uh, most simply, um, and that as our costs go up for things, insurance companies, although they try to contain costs, uh, there is also cost increases for them as well that to, to for the repairs that Commissioner talked about or other types of insured events. So I think it's just important to remember just that them in the context of the overall uh, overall economy. Well, thank you. Tell us a little, tell me a little bit more about the actuaries. Are these individuals, are they companies and corporations? What is the relationship with the industry? Are they academic? Yeah, that's a great question. And I am a lawyer. So to me, actuaries are wizards uh, because they deal with uh, really complex numbers. And sometimes their explanations of those complex numbers are not reduced into the simple words that lawyers uh, can understand and like to talk about. But uh, actuaries are essentially looking at large data sets and uh, applying different assumptions in order to 
uh, come to in this case an understanding of what would be a justified rate increase. So there are actu there are uh, firms that employ actuaries, and certainly there are individual actuaries within those uh, firms uh, with whom uh, we contract out. Um, so we do not employ actuaries. Uh, it's a very um, specific um, experience uh, set that demands a very high salary. Uh, so we contract out for those services and do not employ them within the department. Um, and uh, we, we deal with them and send them uh, for all of those uh, rate increases that you mentioned. We are having constant conversations with the actuaries. D does that address your question? I'm sorry if I missed something. Yes, thank you. Overall, it does. Uh, but I wondered if they were large corporations. Are they individual entities, economists? Oh, the size of the firms? Yeah, good question. I, I, I'm familiar with the specific individuals, but not the overall size of the firms that employ them, Bill. So we, we have uh, a handful of contracts with actuaries at the department. One of those firms that I can think of that we that I recently worked with on a, on a company uh, has three employees and it's kind of just set up as a partnership. They're all qualified actuaries and all have a great deal of experience, very small company. Uh, most of the contracts that we have are with uh, that, so not not three employees, but but it's not a large corporation that would have it. It's more of a partnership, or a, mm -hmm. like you might think of a CPA, a, 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 a local CPA firm is is the way you might think of it. Well, thank you, members. Do we have other questions? Well, you have snowed them. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. The second part of our presentation is. Uh, from um, I guess I would allow Mr. Sanders to introduce himself. Okay. Yes, kindly state your name, your title, and your affiliations, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Benjamin Sanders. I could uh, tell Mr. Chairman you were struggling to see if I was here on behalf of Farm Bureau Insurance, on behalf of the industry, or on behalf of personal interest, I suppose. Uh, perhaps all three would be appropriate. I have two introductory comments to make. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I want to note what the commissioner said a moment ago about other states. Tennessee is unique and special. I've had the chance to spend time with Farm Bureaus in other states, and they don't have the relationship between the legislature, the department, and the insurance industry that we have here. We have a very good relationship, not always an agreeable one, but a good relationship, and it's consumers that win. I feel it's important to always remember that. The second thing, Mr. Chairman, I have to apologize to you. I uh, confess that I sandbagged you a little bit when you asked uh, about speaking today to give an industry perspective on an insurance overview. I somewhat acted like I didn't know what I was going to say, but the reality is that every semester I give a lecture at UT on the history and evolution of the insurance industry. I'm not suggesting that a group of lawmakers is like a group of college students, but I am saying that it's a rare opportunity to uh, give a lecture to lawmakers because usually that gets us in trouble as lobbyists. I'm not going to obviously go through an exhaustive history of insurance, although I personally find it interesting. If we did that, I suspect you would lose a quorum. But I believe that there are some turning points in the history of insurance that adds color to what we do. And it adds depth and uh, meaning to this thing that we call insurance that's important to us and important to your constituents. The year, every good story starts like that, right? The year was 1750 BC in the Code of Hammurabi. I'm not going to dwell long, Mr. Chairman, on history. The Code of Hammurabi in the year 1750 BC had a provision that if a merchant had a loan, they could pay the banker an extra amount. And if the ship was lost at sea, the banker would cancel the loan. Now, I didn't use the term insurance, 
but it was the first instance in history of insurance. And interestingly, that code of Hammer Rabbi, which you studied about in school, I'm sure, went into the penalties if the banker did not honor that. So one might say that insurance regulation goes back almost 4,000 years uh, in history. Uh, the next instance, and in moving through Greek and Roman culture, uh, we started to see benefit societies spring up where people could, families could join. And well, again, they didn't use the term insurance, but if someone became incapacitated or died, that society would provide for that family. Very, very similar to what we have now with life insurance. In the year 1347 in Genova, Italy, that was the first time in history, another turning point, that a standalone insurance policy was issued, unrelated to uh, a loan or a merchant or a family or anything like that, a standalone insurance policy. In 1347, the actual term insurance came into use in the year 1552. Uh, there was a book published called Of Insurance and Merchant Bets. This notion of transferring risk, like Mr. Huddleston said, transferring risk for a premium had been prevalent for hundreds, thousands of years, hundreds or thousands of years. But in 1552 is the first time the actual term insurance was used, and we're still using it. The first insurance regulation was published in the United Kingdom in the year 1601 to govern how insurance companies at that time treated their policyholders. Obviously, they used different terms. The next big turning point was in the year 1666. If you remember from history, that was the Great Fire in London. Fire swept through London. They estimated that a third of London's population was homeless. 100,000 people in that year lost their homes. Some of them lived in tents for up to eight years. The reason I say that, it's notable for two things. A, those individuals didn't rebuild their homes because they didn't have the means to. You think about that. They didn't have the means to do it, that many people. But then the second thing, is that same year, a fellow named Nicholas Barbin started the first home insurance company. After that fire, he realized a niche for it. That was the first time that insurance came away from uh, the merchant class and, and trading class, those kind of things, into personal lines for individuals. You've heard the term underwriting in insurance. It was about this time that the term underwriting started coming into use. At that time, if a merchant was taking a ship and wanted to uh, have people uh, uh, to share the risk on that, they would literally go to a coffee house and put up a sign that said, I'm taking this voyage. If you want to share in the risk, write your name under here. Isn't that interesting? And so they called those people that shared the risk underwriters. They became known as people not just that shared the financial risk, but analyzed that risk. So we've been using the term underwriter for literally 400 years. Uh, interestingly, where that became most popular was a single coffee shop in London uh, owned by a guy named Edward Lloyd. The group of underwriters, Representative Thompson knows where I'm going, that group of underwriters formed an association in the 1600s called Lloyd's of London, which is still in operation today, and it started at Edward Lloyd's coffee shop. Uh, it was about this time in the late 1600s, Dr. Kumar, you ask about the term actuary that the term actuary started coming into place. What these underwriters started realizing is they needed someone more professional to analyze the risk. And so the field of someone that analyzes risk and the financial values started coming into play. Uh, the first life insurance company in history was called Equitable Life Company in 1762. And at that time, it was the first time that they used the term actuary, and that was the title for their CEO because his job was to analyze the risk. Uh, and essentially, we have been using that same model since then. A couple of points about US history. <clears throat> the department mentioned that we're state regulated. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case in 1869 that said that insurance is not commerce. Uh, and because of that, it was regulated by the states. There was a subsequent case in 1944 that said actually insurance is commerce and should be regulated by the federal government. That's what gave rise to, as Bill mentioned, 1840, excuse me, 1945, the McCarran-Ferguson Act that put into federal law that insurance was still regulated at the state level, and we're still operating under that today. 
Uh, there's a few interesting, I believe, interesting and unique things about the nature of insurance, I believe worth mentioning. Insurance is the only industry that bails out its competitors. In Tennessee and in most states, we have what we call the Life and Health Guarantee Fund and the Property Casualty Guarantee Fund. Companies pay an assessment into that fund, and if a company goes insolvent, that fund pays the claims of all of those policyholders. That was put into place many, many years ago to make sure that if a company goes under, that policyholders are protected. Insurance is the only industry that sells a product where the company doesn't know what it costs when they sell the product. Let that sink in. That's where actuaries come from, underwriters, to analyze that risk because companies have to predict events, they predict cost, and they predict the utilization and hope that they price it right for that product. Insurance is the only industry required by law to make a profit. Mr. Huddleston mentioned uh, the solvency requirements. Obviously, that's important to make sure that companies can pay their claims. Insurance companies are required by law to make a profit enough to put into their reserve funds. And then lastly, insurance is the only industry that has to have governmental approval, not just for the prices they charge and premiums, but how those are calculated. I want to again compliment the department and their staff on their uh, rate approval process. Uh, they are responsive and responsible to the industry and to the long-term needs of the industry, and we deeply appreciate that. There are a few terms <clears throat> that in this committee this year, uh, you will probably hear if you, if you aren't already familiar with them. One of those is loss ratio. Uh, in the health insurance industry, we call this the medical loss ratio or the MLR. The loss ratio is simply how much of the premium dollar is paid out in claims. The Affordable Care Act requires companies to have uh, health insurance companies to have at least an 80% medical loss ratio. That means 80 cents out of every premium dollar for health insurance has to go directly to pay for claims costs through medical care. Now that other 20% isn't a profit margin. That's the total operating cost. So your operating cost, your profit margin, your taxes, all of those come out of that 20%. On average, the average insurance company profit across all lines is between two and 3%. That's why you don't see small insurance companies because it's all about the law, uh, law of large numbers. Uh, we use the terms covered peril and covered benefit. These are things that are covered by an insurance policy, whether a medical policy or property casualty. There's a balance in finding the appropriate amount of coverages at the appropriate cost. And it's a balance. We could write a policy that covers everything for everyone, but the reality is that no one could afford a policy like that. So we look for that balance. The term indemnity is used, and indemnity is, called, is uh, referred to as the made whole doctrine. The point of insurance, uh, and you heard earlier, was to provide a, a safety net from financial risk, but indemnity is to make you whole. So when you have a car wreck, and you file a claim, it's to replace the kind of car you have. Same thing with a house, all of those kind of things. Uh, you've, you'll hear the term reinsurance in, in uh, the insurance industry. Reinsurance is just that. It's insurance for insurance. Most insurance companies will cover up to a certain amount of loss. After that, they offload that risk to other insurance companies. You'll hear us talk a fair amount about waste, abuse, and fraud. Uh, most provisions in insurance that people don't like, the hoops you have to jump through, if you will, that none of us like when you file claims. Almost all of those, if not all of them, came from some instance at some point in history of someone committing waste, fraud, and abuse. Waste is the unnecessary utilization of insurance provisions. That's why we have deductibles. That's why we have things like cost sharing uh, and co-insurance in some instances. It's to give people in the game, to uh, people skin in the game, to ensure that they are not being wasteful with their insurance provisions. Abuse is the deliberate exploitation of provisions for personal gain. And we could talk a fair amount of this, uh, but by far it's the most prevalent thing that we see in insurance as far as leakage of cost uh, and where monies go from the premium dollar. Every now and again, uh, you will have, and I can't think of any instance that you'll see this year, every now and again, we bring legislation to correct what could be a loophole, because we see in other states somebody has figured out a loophole and they're trying to exploit it. 
and we try to close those loopholes here. We try to be diligent about it to, uh, to keep that abuse down. One example of that a few years ago, you may remember there was legislation here dealing with sinkholes. Uh, and the reason for that is we have a sinkhole coverage mandate on the books. The only other state that has that is Florida. We saw in Florida a dramatic increase in sinkhole claims. There was a law firm in Florida that started specializing in sinkhole claims. And before Florida got their situation fixed, that single law firm was netting, netting $100 million from sinkhole claims. That was paid by Florida policyholders. Florida doesn't have more sinkholes than we do. They had more sinkhole lawsuits. We closed that loophole here because we didn't want to see the same thing in Tennessee. And then lastly, uh, deliberate fraud. We hear a lot about that. It is ho often hard to detect fraud. I won't talk much about it, but I will leave one figure on this topic. It's estimated that every year in America, $360 billion are spent for insurance fraud. That's $880 for every man, woman, and child in America that comes out of their pockets from insurance to cover the fraud that we can't detect. It's far more prevalent than we think about. Companies spend significant time looking for fraud. Chairman, you asked earlier what drives the insurance claims cost. A few thoughts on that. First and foremost, claims cost. The frequency and the severity of claims. They drive the vast majority of those claims costs. When something moves the needle on claims cost, it moves the needle on premiums. Simple as that. Our underwriting cost uh, is something that companies pay significant attention to. When we analyze risk to put that on the books, we're very careful to make sure that the risk we put on the books is not endangering the affordability of, of policyholders we already have on the books. An example of that for an auto policy, it cost us on average $140 cost to put an auto policy on the books. We have to make sure that that risk is appropriate so we don't have to cross subsidize it with other risk. Claims adjusting cost is something that we pay attention to, and that's everything from the claims adjuster you talk to, to the paperwork and all of the costs that are wrapped up in that. And then lastly, of course, there's the expense ratio, uh, and that's simply the operating cost of an insurance company. Uh, this is where that one narrow piece, which depends on how you slice the numbers, is in the single digits of cost. That's where companies compete. If you think about all those other costs, they're baked into the premium, and there's not much a company can do about them. But that operating cost is where insurance companies compete, and it's very small. The last thing I'll leave you with, Mr. Chairman, and then happy to answer any questions, is uh, a bit of a higher level view than the rest of this. Mr. Huddleston talked about the impact of insurance on uh, society, on businesses, and on individuals. I want to talk about it for a moment on how insurance impacts the middle class. We hear for years, we've heard for decades, that the middle class, maintaining a middle class is critical for civilization. Of course, we've all read about that and heard about that. Lawmakers love to talk about helping the middle class. And the middle class is important. It's why America is a superpower, because we have such a large middle class. First, the middle class is hard to define. In 2009, President Obama formed a task force to raise the living standards for middle class. They got hung up on defining what exactly is the middle class. It's pretty hard when you start to think about it. I personally define it as the economic class that has the ability to create and sustain assets. In other words, you're not living paycheck to paycheck. And I'm going to make a bold assertion. The reason that we have a strong middle class in America and in most advanced civil, uh, societies now is because of insurance. Prior to the onset of widespread insurance, there were two groups of people. There were the wealthy that could withstand any financial hit, and there were the people that were one catastrophe away from destitution. It's hard for us, and I'm putting myself in that group, to, insurance is so ingrained in society, it's hard for us to envision what life would be like without insurance because we've all grown up with it. But it's not always been there. And it's not there for a lot of people. I was in one of our county offices a few years ago, uh, Ray County, 
was talking to our agency manager and he got a phone call from a policyholder. I could only his, hear his end of the conversation. A lady, her, her rate had gone up because of inflation. You heard the department talk about that. And she was asking how she could lower her auto premium because she was saying, I don't know if I can afford it. Is there any way I can lower it? So they talked through it and got off the phone. And so I asked the manager, I said, Ken, out of curiosity, because 15 minutes on the phone with her, I said, how much did her policy go up? He said, $4 a month. That's what she was worried about. Those of us in this room, I'd, willing, I'd be willing to bet, are going to pay insurance because we have assets to protect. A lot of people out there wake up every day and look at their finances every month and figure out if they can afford insurance. The notion of using insurance to transfer wealth or to protect their assets or retirement, that's not what they're thinking about. What they're thinking about is, if I wreck my car, I won't have a car because I can't buy another one. And what do I do if I can't afford insurance and then I can't afford a car? Or they're thinking, I really want to buy a house. Can I afford the insurance on the house because the lender requires it? It's easy to forget that. There's a lot of people in both the U.S. and in Tennessee that live that. And that affordability is our biggest challenge. I mentioned earlier we have a really good environment in Tennessee for insurance. If you look, and I won't take your time today, but do some research, I encourage you, into what happened in Florida last year. I don't exaggerate when I say that Florida's insurance market almost collapsed last year in 2022. They had two special sessions because all of the major homeowners carriers said, we're not writing insurance anymore. The losses were too much. And that wasn't from hurricanes. That was from the politics that they had down there. They got it fixed. I encourage you to do that research. But the reason I say that is the insurance market that we have here didn't happen by accident. It's diligent action from the department over decades, diligent uh, action from the legislature for decades, and diligent action from the industry to bring things to your attention, to bring things to the table when there's items we need to be fixed, and to be a responsible partner. And it won't stay that way by accident either. On behalf of the industry, we deeply appreciate the relationship that we have with the legislature, Mr. Chairman, and with the department. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? No, they are fairly well informed and overwhelmed. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, we will go back into session. Uh, as a housekeeping matter, everybody. Uh, every member should have received or your offices should have received a copy of the insurance committee uh, bylaws. Kindly look them over. You don't have to memorize them, but they're worth looking it over. Uh, any other further business? Yeah, I just I meant to compliment the department. I had a situation in my district that was a First Amendment issue. Uh, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go into detail, but I want to thank uh, the Fire Marshal uh, Gary Farley and the department for coming out and, and helping my situation in, in my district. So, so hats off, uh, Department of Commerce and Insurance. It's good to know. I certainly believe that the department has been very responsive. In my district, I've frequently ask people to call the department for various matters, and they have been uh, very helpful and satisfied. Any other matters to discuss, members? Seeing none, we stand adjourned. <clears throat>